Book Two, Chapter Two of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, The Soul Expands.com. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Two The Night of Dread. The feast dragged slowly on, for fear was of the company. The men and women were silent, and when they drank, it was as if one had poured a little oil on a dying fire. Life flamed up in them for a moment. Their laughter came like the crackling of thorns, and then they were silent again. Meanwhile, the wanderer drank little, waiting to see what should come. But the queen was watching him, whom already her heart desired, and she only of all the company had pleasure in this banquet. Suddenly, a side door opened behind the dais. There was a stir in the hall, each guest turning his head fearfully, for all expected some evil tidings, but it was only the entrance of those who bear about in the feasts of Egypt an effigy of the dead the likeness of a mummy carved in wood, and who cry, Drink, O king, and be glad. Thou shalt soon be even as he. Drink, and be glad. The stiff, swathed figure, with his folded hands and gilded face, was brought before the pharaoh and Manepta, who had sat long in sullen, brooding silence, started when he looked on it. Then he broke into an angry laugh. We have little need of thee tonight, he cried, as he saluted the symbol of Osiris. Death is near enough. We want not thy silent preaching. Death, death is near. He fell back in his gilded chair and let the cup drop from his hand, gnawing at his beard. Art thou a man? spoke Meriam in a low clear voice are you men and yet afraid of what comes to all is it only tonight that we first hear the name of death remember the great menkara remember the old pharaoh who built the pyramid of her he was just and kind and he feared the gods and for his reward they showed him death coming on him in six short years did he scowl and tremble like all of you tonight who are scared by the threats of slaves nay he outwitted the gods he made night into day he lived out twice his years with revel and love and wine in the lamp-lit groves of persia trees come my guests let us be merry if it be but for an hour drink and be brave. For once thou speakest well, said the king. Drink and forget. The gods who give death give wine. And his angry eyes ranged through the hall to seek some occasion of mirth and scorn. Thou wanderer, he said suddenly. Thou drinkest not. I have watched thee as the cups go round. What, man? Thou comest from the north. The son of thy pale land has not heed enough to foster the vine. Thou seemest cold and a drinker of water. Why wilt thou be cold before thine hour? Come, pledge me in the red wine of Kim. Bring forth the cup of Pasht, he cried to them who waited. Bring forth the cup of Pasht, the king drinks. Then the chief butler of Pharaoh went to the treasure house and came again bearing a huge golden cup fashioned in the form of a lion's head and holding twelve measures of wine it was an ancient cup sacred to pasht and a gift of the retinue to thotmes the greatest of that name fill it full of unmixed wine cried the king dost thou grow pale at the sight of the cup Thou wanderer from the north, I pledge thee, pledge thou me. Nay, king, said the wanderer, 
I have tasted wine of Ismarus before today, and I have drunk with the wild host, the one-eyed man-eater. For his heart was angered by the king, and he forgot his wisdom, but the queen marked the same. Then pledge me in the cup of Hosht, quoth the king. I pray thee, pardon me, said the wanderer, for wine makes wise men foolish and strong men weak, and tonight methinks we shall need our wits and our strength. Craven, cried the king, give me the bowl. I drink to thy better courage, wanderer. And lifting the great golden cup, he stood up and drank it, and then dropped staggering into his chair, his head fallen on his breast. I may not refuse a king's challenge, though it is ill to contend with our hosts, said the wanderer, turning somewhat pale, for he was in anger. Give me the bowl. He took the cup and held it high. Then, pouring a little forth to his gods, he said in a clear voice, for he was stirred to anger beyond his wont, I drink to the strange Hathor. He spoke and drained the mighty cup and set it down on the board, and even as he laid down the cup, and as the queen looked at him with eyes of wrath, there came from the bowl beside his seat a faint shrill sound, a ringing and a singing of the bow, a noise of running strings, and a sound as of rushing arrows. The warrior heard it, and his eyes burned with the light of battle, for he knew well that the swift shafts should soon fly to the hearts of the doomed. Pharaoh awoke and heard it, and heard it the Lady of Mariamun, the queen, and she looked on the wanderer astonished, and looked on the bow that sang. The minstrel's tale was true. This is none other but the bow of Odysseus, the sacker of cities, said Meriamun. Hearken thou, Eperitus, thy great bow sings aloud. How comes it that thy bow sings? For this cause, queen, said the wanderer, because birds gather on the bridge of war. Soon shall shafts be flying and ghosts go down to doom. Summon thy guards, I bid thee, for foes are near. Terror conquered the drunkenness of Pharaoh. He bade the guards who stood behind his chair summon all their company. They went forth, and a great hush fell upon the hall of banquets, and upon those who sat at meat therein. The silence grew deadly still like air before the thunder, and men's hearts sank within them. Only Odysseus wondered and thought on the battle to be. Though whence the foe might come he knew not, and Mariamun sat erect in her ivory chair and looked down the glorious hall. Deeper grew the silence and deeper yet, and more and more the cloud of fear gathered in the hearts of men. Then suddenly through all the hall there was a rush, like the rush of mighty wings. The deep foundations of the palace rocked, and to the sight of men the roof above seemed to burst asunder, and lo, above them, against the distance of the sky, there swept a shape of fear, and the star shone through its raiment. Then the roof closed in again, and for a moment's space, once more there was silence, whilst men looked with white faces each on each, and even the stout heart of the wanderer stood still. Then suddenly, all down the hall, from this place and from that, men rose up, and with one great cry fell down dead, this one across the board and that one across the floor. The wanderer grasped his bow and counted. From among those who sat at meat, twenty and one had fallen dead. Yet those who lived sat gazing emptily, for so stricken with fear were they, that scarce did each one know, if it was he himself who lay dead or his brother who had sat by his side. But Mariamun looked down the hall with cold eyes, for she feared neither death nor life, nor God nor man. And while she looked, and while the wanderer counted, there rose 
a faint murmuring sound from the city without a sound that grew and grew the thunder of myriad feet that run before the death of kings then the doors burst asunder and a woman sped through them in her night robes and in her arms she bore the naked body of a boy pharaoh she cried pharaoh and thou o queen look upon thy son thy first-born son dead is thy son o pharaoh dead is thy son o queen in my arms he died suddenly as i lulled him to his rest and she laid the body of the child down on the board among the vessels of gold among the garlands of lotus flowers and the beakers of rose-red wine then pharaoh rose and rent his purple robes and wept aloud Meriamun rose too and lifting the body of her son clasped it to her breast and her eyes were terrible with wrath and grief but she wept not see now the curse that is this evil woman this false hathor hath brought upon us she said but the very guest sprang up crying it is not the hathor whom we worship it is not the holy hathor it is the gods of those dark apura whom thou o queen wilt not let go on thy head and the head of pharaoh be it and even as they cried the murmur without grew to a shriek of woe a shriek so wild and terrible that the palace walls rang again that shriek rose and yet a third time never was such a cry heard in egypt and now for the first time in all his days the face of the wanderer grew white with fear and in fear of heart he prayed for succor to his goddess to aphrodite the daughter of dion again the doors behind them burst open and the guards flocked in mighty men of many foreign lands but now their faces were wan their eyes stared wide and their jaws hung down but at the sound of the clanging of their harness the strength of the wanderer came back to him again for the gods and their vengeance he feared but not the sword of man and now once more the bow sang aloud he grasped it he bent it with his mighty knee and strung it crying awake pharaoh awake foes draw on say be these all the men then the captain answered these be all of the guard who are left living in the palace the rest are stark smitten by the angry gods now as the captain spake one came running up the hall heeding neither the dead nor the living it was the old priest ray the commander of the legion of amen who had been the wanderer's guide and his looks were wild with fear hearken pharaoh he cried thy people lie dead by thousands in the streets the houses are full of dead in the temples of ptah and amen many of the priests have fallen dead also hast thou more to tell old man cried the queen the tale has not all been told o queen the soldiers are mad with fear and with the sight of death and slay their captains barely have i escaped from those in my command of the legion of amen for they swear that this death has been brought upon the land because the pharaoh would not let the apura go hither then they come to slay the pharaoh and thee also o queen and with them come many thousands of people catching up such arms as lie to their hands now pharaoh sank down groaning but the queen spake to the wanderer anon thy weapon sang of war Eperitus, now war is at the gates little i fear the rush of battle and the blows men deal in anger lady he made answer though a man may fear the gods without shame ho guards close up close up round me look not so pale-faced now death from the gods is done with and we have but to fear the sword of men so great was his mien and so glorious his face as he cried thus and one 
by one drew his long arrows forth and laid them on the board that the trembling guards took heart and to the number of fifty and one ranged themselves on the edge of the dais in a double line then they also made ready their bows and loosened the arrows in their quivers now from without there came a roar of men and anon while those of the house of pharaoh and of the guests and nobles who sat at the feast and yet lived fled behind the soldiers the brazen doors were burst in with mighty blows and through them a great armed multitude surged along the hall there came soldiers broken from their ranks there came the embalmers of the dead their hands were over full of work tonight but they left their work undone death had smitten some even of these and their fellows did not shrink back from them now there came the smith black from the forge and the scribe bold with endless writing and the dyer with his purple hands and the fisher from the stream and the stunted weaver from the loom and the leper from the temple gates they were mad with lust of life a starveling life that the king had taxed when he let not the Apura go. They were mad with fear of death. The women followed them with dead children in their arms. They smote down the golden furnishings. They tore the silken hangings. They cast the empty cups of the feast at the faces of trembling ladies and cried aloud for the blood of the king. Where is Pharaoh? they yelled. Show us Pharaoh and the queen Miriamun that we may slay them dead are our firstborn they lie in heaps as the fish lay when sihor ran red and with blood dead are they because of the curse that has been brought upon us by the prophets of the apura whom pharaoh and pharaoh's queen yet hold in kim now as they cried they saw pharaoh and Neptah cowering behind the double line of guards and they saw the queen, Mariamun, who cowered not, but stood silent above the den. Then she thrust her way through the guards, and yet holding the body of the child to her breast, she stood before them with eyes that flashed more brightly than the Uraeus crown upon her brow. Back! she cried. Back! It is not Pharaoh, it is not I who have brought this death upon you, for we too have death here, and she held up the body of her dead son. It is that false Hathor whom ye worship, that witch of many a voice and many a face who turns your hearts faint with love. For her sake ye endure these woes, on her head is all this death. Go, Tear her temple stone from stone, and rend her beauty limb from limb, and be avenged and free the land from curses. A moment the people stood and hearkened, muttering as stands the lion that is about to spring, while those who pressed without cried, Forward, forward, slay them, slay them. Then, as with one voice, they screamed, the Hathor we love, but you we hate, for ye have brought these woes upon us, and ye shall die. They cried, they brawled, they cast footstools and stones at the guards, and then a certain tall man among them drew a bow. Straight at the queen's fair breast he aimed his arrow, and swift and true it sped towards her. She saw the light gleam upon its shining barb. And then she did what no woman but Mariamun would have done. No, not to save herself from death. She held out the naked body of her son as a warrior holds a shield. The arrow struck through and through it, piercing the tender flesh, aye, and pricked her breast beyond, so that she let the dead boy fall. The wanderer saw it and wondered at the horror of the deed, for he had seen no such deed in all his days. Then shouting aloud the terrible war cry 
of the Achaeans. He leapt upon the board before him, and as he leapt, his golden armor clanged. Glancing around, he fixed an arrow to the string and drew to his ear that gray bow which none but he might so much as bend. Then as he loosed, the string sang like a swallow, and the shaft screamed through the air. Down the glorious hall it sped and full on the breast of him who had lifted bow against the queen, the bitter arrow struck. Nor might his harness avail to stay it. Through the body of him it passed, and with blood-red feathers flew on, and smote another who stood behind him, so that his knees also were loosened, and together they fell dead upon the floor. Now, while the people stared and wondered, again the bowstring sang like a swallow, again the arrow screamed in its flight, and he who stood before it got his death, for the shield he bore was pinned to his breast. Then wonder turned to rage. The multitude rolled forward, and from either side the air grew dark with arrows, for the guards, at the sight of the shooting of the wanderer, found heart, and fought well and manfully. Boldly also the slayers came on, and behind them pressed many a hundred men. The wanderer's golden helm flashed steadily, a beacon in the storm. Black smoke burst out in the hall. The hangings flamed and tossed in a wind from the open door. The lights were struck from the hands of the golden images. Arrows stood thick in the tables and the rafters. A spear pierced through the golden cup of Pasht. But out of the darkness and smoke and dust and the cry of battle, and through the rushing of the rain of spears sang the swallow string with a black bow of Eurytus. And the long shafts shrieked as they sped on them who were ripe to die. In vain did the arrows of the slayers smite upon that golden harness. They were but as hail upon the temple roofs, but as driving snow upon the wild stag's horns. They struck, they rattled, and down they dropped like snow, or bounded back and lay upon the board. The swallow string sang, the black bow twanged, and the bitter arrow shrieked as they flew. Now the wanderer's shafts were spent, and he judged that their case was desperate, for out of the doors of the hall that were behind them, and from the chambers of the women, armed men burst in also, taking them on the flank and rear. But the wanderer was old in war, and without a match in all its ways. The captain of the guard was slain with a spear stroke, and the wanderer took his place, calling to the men, such of them as were left alive, to form a circle on the dais. And within the circle he set those of the house of Pharaoh, and the women who were at the feast. And to Pharaoh he cast a slain man's sword bidding him strike for life and throne, if he never struck before. But the heart was out of Pharaoh because of the death of his son, and the wine about his wits, and the terrors he had seen. Then Meriamun the queen snatched the sword from his trembling hand and stood holding it to guard her life, for she disdained to crouch upon the ground as did the other women, but stood upright behind the wanderer and heeded not the spears and arrows that dealt death on every hand. But Pharaoh stood, his face buried in his hands. Now the slayers came on, shouting and clamoring upon the dais. Then the wanderer rushed on them with sword drawn and shield on high, and so swift he smote that men might not guard, for they saw, as it were, three blades aloft at once, and the silver-hafted sword bit deep, the gift of Phasian Euralus long ago. The guards also smote and thrust. It was for their lives they fought, and back rolled the tide of foes, leaving a swath of dead. So a second time they came on, and a second time were rolled back. Now the defenders few were left unhurt, and their strength was well-nigh spent, 
but the wanderer cheered them with great words, though his heart grew fearful for the end, and Mariamun the queen also bade them to be of good courage, and if need were, to die like men. Then once again the wave of war rolled in upon them, and the strife grew fierce and desperate. The iron hedge of spears was well nigh broken, and now the wanderer, doing such deeds as had not been known in Kim, stood alone between Mariam and the queen and the swords that thirsted for her life and the life of Pharaoh. Then of a sudden, from far down the great hall of banquets, there came a loud cry that shrilled above the clang of swords, the groans of men, and all the din of battle. Pharaoh! 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 rose a voice. Now wilt thou let the people go? Then he who smote stayed his hand, and he who guarded dropped his shield. The battle ceased, and all turned to look. There at the end of the hall, among the dead and dying, there stood the two ancient men of the Apura, and in their hands were cedar rods. It is the wizards, the wizards of Apura, men cried, and shrunk this way and that, thinking no more on war. The ancient men drew nigh. They took no heed of the dying or the dead. On they walked, through blood and wine and fallen tables and scattered arms, till they stood before the pharaoh. Pharaoh! 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 They cried again. Dead are the firstborn of Kim at the hand of Jabra. Wilt thou let the people go? And then Pharaoh lifted his face and cried, Get you gone, you and all that is yours. Get you gone swiftly, and let Kim see your face no more. The people heard, and the living left the hall, and silence fell on the city, and on the dead who died of the sword, and the dead who died of the pestilence. Silence fell, and sleep and the God's best gift, forgetfulness. End of Book 2, Chapter 2 Recording by Marcel Ward for SoulExpands.com Book 2, Chapter 3 of The World's Desire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, TheSoulExpands.com The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 3 The Baths of Bronze Even out of this night of dread, the morning rose, and with it came Ray bearing a message from the king. But he did not find the wanderer in his chamber. The palace eunuchs said that he had risen and had asked for Kuri, the captain of the Sidonians, who was now the queen's jeweler. Thither Ray went, for Kuri was lodged with the servants in a court of the royal house, and as the old man came, he heard the sound of hammers beating on metal. There in the shadow in which the palace wall cast into a little court, there was the wanderer, no longer in his golden mail, but with bare arms and dressed in such a light smock as the workmen of Kim were wont to wear. The wanderer was bending over a small brazier, whence a flame and a light blue smoke arose and melted into the morning light. In his hand he held a small hammer and he had a little anvil by him, on which lay one of the golden shoulder-plates of his armor. The other pieces were heaped beside the brazier. Kuri, the Sidonian, stood beside him, with graving tools in his hands. Hail to thee, Eperitus, cried Ray, calling him by the name he had chosen to give himself. What makest thou here with fire and anvil? I am but furbishing up my armor, said the wanderer, smiling. 
It has more than one dent from the fight in the hall. And he pointed to his shield, which was deeply scarred across the blazon of the white bull, the cognizance of dead Paris, Priam's son. Sidonian, blow up the fire. Curry crouched on his hams and blew the blaze to a white heat with a pair of leathern bellows, while the wanderer fitted the plates and hammered at them on the anvil, making the jointures smooth and strong talking meanwhile with Ray. Strange work for a prince, as thou must be in Alibus, whence thou comest, quoth Ray, leaning on his long rod of cedar, headed with an apple of bluestone. In our country, chiefs do not labor with their hands. Different lands, different ways, answered the Paratus. In my country, Men wed not their sisters as your kings do, though. Indeed, it comes into my mind that once I met such brides in my wanderings in the Isle of the King of the Winds. For the thought of the Aeolian Isle, where King Aeolus gave him all the winds in a bag, came into his memory. My hands can serve me in every deed, he went on, mowing the deep green grass in spring, or driving oxen, or cutting a clean furrow with a plow in heavy soil, or building houses and ships, or doing smith's work with gold and bronze and gray iron. They are all one to me. Or the work of war, said Ray, for there I have seen thee labor. Now, listen. Thou wanderer, the king Menepti and the queen Meriamun send me to thee with this scroll of their will. And he drew forth a roll of papyrus, bound with golden threads, and held it on his forehead, bowing as if he prayed. What is that roll of thine? said the wanderer, who was hammering at the bronze spear point that stood fast in his helm. Ray undid the golden thread and opened the scroll, which he gave into the wanderer's hand. Gods, what have we here? said the wanderer. Here are pictures, tiny and cunningly drawn, serpents in red and little figures of men sitting or standing, axes and snakes and birds and beetles. My father, what tokens are these? And he gave the scroll back to Ray. The king has made his chief scribe write to thee, naming thee captain of the legion of Pasht. The guard of the royal house, for last night, the captain was slain. He gives thee a high title, and he promises thee houses, lands, and a city of the south to furnish thee with wine, and a city of the north to furnish thee with corn, if thou wilt be his servant. Never have I served any man, said the wanderer, flushing red, though I went near to being sold and to knowing the day of slavery. The king does me too much honor. Thou wouldst fain be gone from Kim? asked the old man eagerly. I would fain find her I came to seek, wherever she may be, said the wanderer, here or otherwhere. Then what answer shall I carry to the king? Time brings thought, said the wanderer. I will see the city if thou wilt guide me. Many cities have I seen, but none so great as this. As we walk, I will consider my answer to your king. He had been working at his helm as he spoke, for the rest of his armor was now mended. He had drawn out the sharp spearhead of bronze, and was balancing it in his hand and trying its edge. A good blade, he said. Better was never hammered. I went near to doing its work, Sidonian, and he turned to Curry as he spoke. Two things of thine I had, thy life and thy spear point. Thy life I gave thee, thy spear point thou didst lend me. Here, take it again. And he tossed the spearhead to the queen's jeweler. I thank thee, Lord, 
answered the Sidonian, thrusting it in his girdle. But he muttered between his teeth, The gifts of enemies are gifts of evil. The wanderer did on his mail, who set the helmet on his head, and spoke to Ray. Come forth, friend, and show me thy city. But Ray was watching the smile on the face of the Sidonian, and he deemed it cruel and crafty and warlike, like the laugh of the Sardana of the sea. He said naught, but called a guard of soldiers, and with the wanderer he passed the palace gates and went out into the city. The sight was strange, and it was not thus that the old man who loved his land would have had the wanderer see it. From all the wealthy houses, and from many of the poorer sort, rang the wail of the women mourners as they sang their dirges for the dead. But in the meaner quarters, many a hovel was marked with three smears of blood, dashed on each pillar of the door and on the lintel. And the sound that came from these dwellings was a cry of mirth and festival. There were two peoples, one laughed, one lamented. And in and out of the houses, marked with the splashes of blood, women were ever going with empty hands, or coming with hands full of jewels, of gold, of silver rings, of cups and purple stuffs. Empty they went out, laden they came in, dark men and women with keen black eyes and the features of birds of prey. They went... They came, they clamoured with delight among the mourning of the men and women of Kim, and none laid a hand on them, none refused them. One tall fellow snatched at the staff of Ray. Lend me thy staff, old man, he said, sneering. Lend me thy jeweled staff for my journey. I do but borrow it. When Yakub comes from the desert, thou shalt have it again. But the wanderer turned on the fellow with such a glance that he fell back. I have seen thee before, he said, and he laughed over his shoulder as he went. I saw thee last night at the feast, and heard thy great bow sing. Thou art not of the folk of Kim. They are a gentle folk, and Yakub wins favor in their sight. What passes now in this haunted land of thine, old man? said the wanderer, for of all the sights that I have seen, this is the strangest. None lifts a hand to save his goods from the thief. Ray the priest groaned aloud. Evil days have come upon Kim, he said. The Apura spoil the people of Kim, ere they fly into the wilderness. Even as he spoke, there came a great lady weeping, for her husband was dead, and her son and her brother all were gone in the breath of the pestilence. She was of the royal house, and richly decked with golden jewels, and the slaves who fanned her, as she went to the temple of Ptah to worship, wore gold chains upon their necks. Two women of the Apura saw her and ran to her, crying, Lend to us those golden ornaments thou wearest. Then, Without a word, she took her gold braces and chains and rings and let them all fall in a heap at her feet. The women of the Apura took them all and mocked her, crying, Where now is thy husband and thy son and thy brother, thou who art of Pharaoh's house? Now thou payest us for the labor of our hands and for the bricks that we made without straw gathering leaves and rushes in the sun. Now thou payest for the stick in the hand of the overseers. Where now is thy husband and thy son and thy brother? And they went still mocking and left the lady weeping. But of all sights, the wanderer held this strangest, and many such there were to see. At first, he would have taken back the spoil and given it to those who wore it, but Ray the priest prayed him to forbear, lest the curse should strike them also. So they pressed on and through the tumult. 
ever seen new sights of greed and death and sorrow. Here a mother wept over her babe, here a bride over her husband. That night the groom of her and of death. Here the fierce faced Apura, clamoring like gulls, tore the silver trinkets from the children of those of the baser sort, or the sacred amulets from the mummies of those who were laid out for burial. And here a water carrier wailed over the carcass of the ass that won him his livelihood. At length, passing through the crowd, they came to a temple that stood near to the temple of the god Ptah. The pylons of this temple faced towards the houses of the city, but the inner courts were built against the walls of Tanis and looked out across the face of the water. Though not one of the largest temples, it was very strong and beautiful in its shape. It was built of the black stone of Syene, and all the polished face of the stone was graven with images of the Holy Hathor. Here she wore a cow's head, and here the face of a woman, but she always bore in her hands the lotus-headed staff and the holy token of life, and her neck was encircled with the collar of the gods. Here dwells that strange Hathor to whom thou didst drink last night, Eparatus, said Ray the priest. It was a wild pledge to drink before the queen, who swears that she brings these woes on Kim, though, indeed, she is guiltless of this. With all the blood on her beautiful head, the Apura and their apostate sorcerer, whom we ourselves instructed, bring the plagues on us. Does the Hathor manifest herself this day? asked the wanderer. That we will ask of the priest, Imperatus. Follow thou me. Now they passed down the avenue of sphinxes within the wall of brick into the garden plot of the goddess and so on through the gates of the outer tower. A priest who watched there threw them wide at the sign that was given of Ray, the master builder, the beloved of Pharaoh, and they came to the outer court. Before the second tower they halted and Ray showed to the wanderer that place upon the pylon roof where the Hathor was wont to stand and sing, till the hearers' hearts were melted like wax. Here they knocked once more and were admitted to the hall of assembly where the priests were gathered, throwing dust upon their heads and mourning those among them who had died with the firstborn. When they saw Ray, the instructed, the prophet of Amen, and the wanderer, clad in golden armor who was with him, they ceased from their mourning, and an ancient priest of their number came forward and, greeting Ray, asked him of his errand. Then Ray took the wanderer by the hand and made him known to the priest, and told him of those deeds that he had done, and how he had saved the life of Pharaoh and of those of the royal house who sat at the feast with Pharaoh. But when will the Lady Hathor sing upon her tower top, said Ray, for the stranger desires to see her and hear her. The temple priest bowed before the wanderer and answered gravely. On the third morn from now the holy Hathor shows herself upon the temple's top, he said, but thou, mighty lord, who art risen from the sea, hearken to my warning, and if indeed thou art no god, dare not to look upon her beauty. If thou dost look, then thy fate shall be as the fate of those who have looked before, and I have loved and have died for the sake of the Hathor. No god am I, said the wanderer, laughing. Yet, perchance, I shall dare to look, and dare to face whatever it be that guards her, if my heart bids me see her nearer. Then there shall be an end of thee and thy wanderings, said the priest. Now follow me, and I will show thee those men who last sought to win the Hathor. He took him by the hand and led him through passages hewn in the walls, until they came to a deep and gloomy cell, where the golden armor of the wanderer shone like a lamp at eve. The cell was built against the city wall, 
and scarcely a thread of light came into the chink between roof and wall. All about the chamber were baths fashioned of bronze, and in the baths lay dusky shapes of dark-skinned men of Egypt. There they lay, and in the faint light their limbs were being anointed by some sad-faced attendants, as folk were anointed by merry girls in the shining baths of the wanderer's home. When Ray and Apparatus came near, the sad-faced bathmen shrank away in shame, as dogs shrink from their evil meat, at night when a traveler goes past. Marveling at the strange sight, the bathers and the bathe, the wanderer looked more closely, and his stout heart sank within him, for all these were dead who lay in the baths of bronze and it was not water that flowed about their limbs, but evil-smelling natron. Here lie those, said the priest, who last strove to come near the Holy Hathor, and to pass into the shrine of the temple where night and day she sits and sings and weaves with her golden shuttle. Here they lie, the half of a score. One by one they rushed to embrace her, and one by one they were smitten down. Here... They are being attired for the tomb, for we give them all rich burial. Truly, quoth the wanderer, I left the world of light behind me when I looked on the blood-red sea and sailed into the black gloom of Pharos. More evil sights have I seen in this haunted land than in all the cities where I have wandered, than on all the seas that I have sailed. Then be warned, said the priest, for if thou dost follow where they went and desire what they desired, thou too shalt lie in yonder bath and be washed of yonder waters. For whatever be false, this is true, that he who seeks love oft times finds doom, but here he finds it most speedily. The wanderer looked again at the dead and at their ministers. And he shuddered till his harness rattled. He feared not the face of death in war or on the sea, but this was a new thing. Little he loved the sight of the brazen baths and those who lay there. The light of the sun and the breath of air seemed good to him, and he stepped quickly from the chamber, while the priest smiled to himself. But when he reached the outer air, his heart came back to him. And he began to ask again about the Hathor, where she dwelt, and what it was that slew her lovers. I will show thee, answered the priest, and brought him through the hall of assembly to a certain narrow way that led to a court. In the center of the court stood the holy shrine of the Hathor. It was a great chamber, built of alabaster, lighted from the roof alone, and shut in with brazen doors before which hung curtains of Tyrian web. From the roof of the shrine, a stairway ran overhead to the roof of the temple, and so to the inner pylon tower. Yonder, stranger, the holy goddess dwells within the alabaster shrine, said the priest. By that stair, she passes to the temple roof, and thence to the pylon top. There by the curtains once in every day we place food, and it is drawn into the sanctuary. How we know not. For none of us have set foot there, nor seen the Hathor face to face. Now when the goddess has stood upon the pylon and sung to the multitude below, she passes back to the shrine. Then the brazen outer doors of the temple court are thrown wide, and the doomed rush on madly, one by one, towards the drawn curtains. Before they pass the curtains, they are thrust back, yet they strive to pass. Then we hear a sound of the clashing of weapons, and the men fall dead without a word, while the song of the Hathor swells from within. And who are her swordsmen? said the wanderer. That we know not, stranger. No man has lived to tell. Come, draw near to the door of the shrine and hearken. Maybe thou would hear the Hathor singing, 
have no fear. Thou needst not approach the guarded space. Then the wanderer drew near with a doubting heart, but Ray the priest stood afar off, though the temple priests came close enough. At the curtains they stopped and listened. Then from within the shrine there came a sound of singing, wild and sweet and shrill, and the voice of it stirred the wanderer strangely, bringing to his mind memories of that Ithaca of which he was lord, and which he should see no more, of the happy days of youth, and of the god-built walls of windy Ilios. But he could not have told why he thought on these things, nor why his heart was thus strangely stirred within him. Hearken! The Hathor sings as she weaves the doom of men, said the priest. And, as he spoke, the singing ended. Then the wanderer took counsel with himself whether he should then and there burst the doors and take his fortune, or whether he should forbear for that while. But in the end, he determined to forbear and see with his own eyes what befell those who strove to win the way. So he drew back, wondering much, and, bidding farewell to the aged priest, he went with Ray, the master builder, through the town of Tanis, where the apparel was still spoiling the people of Kim, and he came to the palace where he was lodged. Here he turned over in his mind how he might see the strange woman of that temple and yet escaped the baths of bronze. There he sat and thought, till at length the night drew on, and one came to summon him to sup with Pharaoh in the hall. Then he rose up and went, and meeting Pharaoh and Meriamun, the queen, in the outer chamber, passed in after them to the hall, and on to the dais which he had held against the rabble, for the place was clear of dead and, save for certain stains upon the marble floor that might not be washed away, and for some few arrows that yet were fixed high up in the walls or in the lofty roof, there was nothing to tell of that great fray that had been fought but one day gone. Heavy was the face of Pharaoh, and the few who sat with them were sad enough because of the death of so many whom they loved and the shame and sorrow that had fallen upon Kim. But there were no tears for her one child in the eyes of Mariamma, the queen. Anger, not grief, tore her heart because Pharaoh had let the Apura go. For ever, as they sat at the sad feast, there came a sound of the tramping feet of armies, and of lowing cattle, and songs of triumph sung by ten thousand voices, and thus they sang the song of the Apura. A lamp for our feet the Lord hath litten, signs hath he shown in the land of Kim, the kings of the nations our Lord hath smitten, his shoe hath he cast o'er the gods of them. He hath made him a mock of the heifer of Isis, he hath broken the chariot reins of Ra. On Yakub he cries, and his folk arises, and the knees of the nation are loosed in awe. He gives us their goods for a spoil to gather, jewels of silver and vessels of gold. For Yahweh of old is our friend and father, and cherisheth Yakub he chose of old. The gods of the peoples our Lord hath chidden. Their courts hath he filled with his creeping things. The light of the face of the sun he hath hidden, and broken the scourge in the hands of kings. He hath chastened his people with stripes and scourges. Our backs hath he burdened with grievous weights. But his children shall rise as a sea that surges, and flood the fields of the men he hates. The kings of the nations our Lord hath smitten, his shoe hath he cast o'er the gods of them. But a lamp for our feet the Lord hath litten, wonders hath he wrought in the land 
of Kim. Thus they sang, and the singing was so wild that the wanderer craved leave to go and stand at the palace gate, lest the Apura should rush in and spoil the treasure chamber. The king nodded, but Mariamun rose and went with the wanderer as he took his bow and passed to the great gates. There they stood in the shadow of the gates, and this is what they beheld. A great light of many torches was flying along the roadway in front. Then came a body of men, rudely armed with pikes, and the torchlight shone on the glitter of bronze and on the gold helms of which they had spoiled the soldiers of Kent. Next came a troop of wild women, dancing and beating timbrels, and singing the triumphant hymn of scorn. Next, with a space between, tramped eight strong black-bearded men, bearing on their shoulders a great gilded coffin, covered with carven and painted signs. It is the body of their prophet, who brought them hither, out of the land of hunger, whispered Mariamun. Slaves, ye shall hunger yet in the wilderness, and clamor for the flesh pots of Kim. Then she cried in a loud voice, for her passion overcame her, and she prophesied to those who bear the coffin, Not one soul of you that lives shall see the land where your conjurer is leading you. Ye shall thirst, ye shall hunger, ye shall call on the gods of Kim, and they shall not hear you. Ye shall die, and your bones shall whiten the wilderness. Farewell, set go with you, farewell. So she cried and pointed down the way, and so fierce was her gaze, and so awful were her words, that the people of the Apura trembled, and the women ceased to sing. The wanderer watched the queen and marveled. Never had woman such a hearty heart, he mused, and it were ill to cross her in love or war. They will sing no more at my gates, murmured Mariamu with a smile. Come, wanderer, they await us. And she gave him her hand that he might lead her. So they went back to the banquet hall. They hearkened as they sat till far in the night, and still the appeal passed, countless as the sands of the sea. At length all were gone, and the sound of their feet died away in the distance. Then Mariamun, the queen, turned to Pharaoh and spake bitterly, Thou art a coward, Menepta, I a coward and a slave at heart. In thy fear of the curse that the false Hathor hath laid on us, she whom thou dost worship, to thy shame, thou hast let these slaves go. Otherwise had our father dealt with them. Great Ramses, Miamun, the hammer of the Kita. Now they are gone, hissing curses on the land that bear them, and robbing those who nursed them up, while they were yet a little people, as a mother nurses her child. What then might I do? said Pharaoh. There is naught to do. All is done, answered Mariamun. What is thy counsel, wanderer? It is ill for a stranger to offer counsel, said the wanderer. Nay, speak, cried the queen. I know not the gods of this land, he answered. If these people be favored of the gods, I say sit still, but if not, then said the wanderer, wise in war, let Pharaoh gather his host, follow after the people, take them unawares, and smite them utterly. It is no hard task, they are so mixed, a multitude encumbered with much baggage. This was to speak as the queen loved to hear. Now she clapped her hands and cried, listen, listen to good counsel, Pharaoh. And now that the Apura were gone, his fear of them went also, and as he drank wine, Pharaoh grew bold, till at last he sprang to his feet and swore by Amen, by Osiris, by Ptah, and by his father, great Ramses, that he would follow after the Apura and smite them. And instantly he sent forth messengers to summon the captains of his host in the hall of assembly. Thither the captains came, 
and their plans were made and messengers hurried forth to the governors of other great cities bidding them send troops to join the host of pharaoh on its march now pharaoh turned to the wanderer and said thou hast not yet answered my message that ray carried to thee this morning wilt thou take service with me and be a captain in this war the wanderer little liked the name of service but his warlike heart was stirred within him for he loved the delight of battle but before he could answer yea or nay Maryam and the queen who was not minded that he should leave her spoke hastily this is my counsel meneptah that the lord of Peritus should abide here in tanis and be the captain of my guard while thou art gone to smite the apura for i may not be here unguarded in these troublous times and if i know he watches over me he who is so mighty a man then i shall walk safely and sleep in peace now the wanderer bethought him of his desire to look upon the hathor for to see new things and try new adventures was always his delight so he answered that if it were pleasing to pharaoh and the queen he would willingly stay and command the guard and pharaoh said that it should be so end of book two chapter three recording by marcel ward the soul dot com book two chapter four of the world's desire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, TheSoulExpands.com. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter 4. The Queen's Chamber. At midday, on the morrow, Pharaoh and the host of Pharaoh marched in pomp from tanis taking the road that runs across the desert country towards the red sea of weeds the way that the apura had gone the wanderer went with the army for an hour's journey and more in a chariot driven by ray the priest for ray did not march with the host the number of the soldiers of pharaoh amazed their kin accustomed to the levies of barren isles and scattered tribes but he said nothing of his wonder to ray or any man lest it should be thought that he came from among a little people. He even made as if he held the army lightly, and asked the priest if this was all the strength of the pharaoh. Then Ray told him that it was but a fourth part, for none of the mercenaries and none of the soldiers from the upper land marched with the king in pursuit of the Apura. Then the wanderer knew that he was come among a greater people than he had ever encountered yet on land or sea so he went with them till the roads divided and there he drove his chariot to the chariot of pharaoh and bade him farewell pharaoh called to him to mount his own chariot and spake thus to him swear to me thou wanderer who namest thyself apparatus thou of what country thou art and what was thy father's house none know Swear to me that thou wilt guard Meriamun, the queen, faithfully, and wilt work no woe upon me, nor open my house while I am afar. Great thou art, and beautiful to look on, ay, and strong enough beyond the strength of men, yet my heart misdoubts me of thee, for methinks thou art a crafty man, and that evil will come upon me through thee. If this be thy mind, Pharaoh, said the wanderer, leave me not in guard of the queen, and yet methinks I did not befriend thee so ill two nights gone, when the rabble would have put thee and all thy house to the sword because of the death of the firstborn. Now Pharaoh looked on him long and doubtfully, then stretched out his hand. The wanderer took it, and swore by his own gods, by Zeus, by Aphrodite, and Athena, and Apollo, that he would be true to the trust. I believe thee, wanderer, said Pharaoh, 
know this, if thou keepest thine oath, thou shalt have great rewards, and thou shalt be second to none in the land of Kim. But if thou failest, then thou shalt die miserably. I ask no fee, answered the wanderer, and I fear no death, for in one way only shall I die, and that is known to me. Yet I will keep my oath. And he bowed before Pharaoh, and leaping from his chariot entered again into the chariot of Ray. Now, as he drove back through the host, the soldiers called to him, saying, Leave us not, wanderer, for he looked so glorious in his golden armor that it seemed to them as though a god departed from their ranks. His heart was with them, for he loved war, and he did not love the Apura. But he drove on, as so it must be, and came to the palace at sundown. That night he sat at the feast by the side of Meriamun the queen, and when the feast was done she bade him follow her into her chamber where she sat when she would be alone. It was a fragrant chamber, dimly lighted with sweet scented lamps, furnished with couches of ivory and gold, while all the walls told painted stories of strange gods and kings, and of their loves and wars. The queen sank back upon the embroidered cushions of a couch and bade the wise Odysseus to sit guard over against her, so near that her robe swept his golden greaves. This he did somewhat against his will, though he was no hater of fair women. But his heart misdoubted the dark-eyed queen, and he looked upon her guardedly, for she was strangely fair to see, the fairest of all mortal women whom he had known, save the golden Helen. Wanderer, we owe thee great thanks, and I would gladly know to whom we are in debt for the price of our lives, she said. Tell me of thy birth, of thy father's house, and of the lands that thou hast seen, and the wars wherein thou hast fought. Tell me also of the sack of Ilios, and how thou camest by thy golden mail. The unhappy Paris wore such arms as these, if the minstrel of the North sang truth. Now the wanderer would gladly have cursed this minstrel of the north and his songs. Minstrels will be lying, lady, he said, and they gather old tales wherever they go. Paris may have worn my arms or another man. I bought them from a chapman in Crete, and asked nothing of their first master. As for Ilios, I fought there in my youth, and served the Cretan Idomeneus, but I got little booty. To the king, the wealth, and women, to us, the sword strokes. Such is the appearance of war. Miriamun listened to his tale, which he set forth roughly, as if he were some blunt, grumbling swordsman. And darkly she looked on him while she hearkened, and darkly she smiled as she looked. A strange story, Apparatus, a strange story truly. Now tell me thus, how camest thou by yonder great bow? the bow of the swallow string. If my minstrel spoke truly, it was once the bow of Eurytus of Oechalia. Now the wanderer glanced round him like a man taken in ambush, who sees on every hand the sword of foes shine up into the sunlight. The bow, lady? He answered readily enough. I got it strangely. I was cruising with a cargo of iron on the western coast and landed on a Nile. Methinks the pilot called it Ithaca. There we found nothing but death. A pestilence had been in the land, but in a ruined hall this bow was lying, and I made prize of it. A good bow. A strange story, truly, a very strange story, quoth Meriamun the queen. By chance thou didst buy the armor of Paris. By chance thou didst find the bow of Eurytus, that bow, methinks with which the godlike Odysseus slew the wooers in his halls. Knowest thou, Eperitus, that when thou stoodest yonder on the board in the place of banquets, when the great bow twanged and the long shafts hailed down on the hall and loosened the knees of many, not a little was I put in mind of the song of the slaying of the wooers at the hands of Odysseus. The fame of Odysseus has wandered far, aye, even to Kim, and she looked straight at him. The wanderer darkened his face and put the matter by. He had heard something of that tale, he said, 
but deemed it a minstrel's feigning. One man could not fight a hundred, as the story went. The queen half rose from the couch, where she lay curled up like a glittering snake. Like a snake she rose and watched him with her melancholy eyes. Strange indeed, most strange that Odysseus, Laertes' son, Odysseus of Ithaca, should not know the tale of the slaying of the wars by Odysseus' self. Strange indeed, thou apparatus, who art Odysseus. Now the neck of the wanderer was in the noose, and well he knew it, yet he kept his counsel and looked upon her vacantly. Men say that this Odysseus wandered years ago into the north, and that this time he will not come again. I saw him in the wars, and he was a taller man than I, said the wanderer. I have always heard, said the queen, that Odysseus was double-tongued and crafty as a fox. Look me in the eyes, thou wanderer, look me in the eyes, and I will show thee whether or not thou art Odysseus. And she leaned forward so that her hair well nigh swept his brow, and gazed deep into his eyes. Now the wanderer was ashamed to drop his eyes before a woman's, and he could not rise and go, so he must needs gaze, and as he gazed his head grew strangely light, and the blood quivered in his veins, and then seemed to stop. Now turn, thou wanderer, said the voice of the queen, and to him it sounded far away as if there was a wall between them, and tell me what thou seest. So he turned and looked towards the dark end of the chamber, but presently through the darkness stole a faint light, like the first gray light of the dawn. And now he saw a shape, like the shape of a great horse of wood, and behind the horse were black square towers of huge stones and gates and walls and houses. Now he saw a door open in the side of the horse, and the helmeted head of a man look out wearily. As he looked, a great white star slid down the sky, so that the light of it rested on the face of the man, and that face was his own. And then he remembered how he had looked forth from the belly of the wooden horse as it stood within the walls of Ilios, and thus the star had seemed to fall upon the doomed city, an omen of the end of Troy. Look again, said the voice of Meriamun from far away. So once more he looked into the darkness, and there he saw the mouth of a cave, and beneath two palms in front of it sat a man and a woman. The yellow moon rose and its light fell upon a sleeping sea, upon tall trees, upon the cave, and the two who sat there. The woman was lovely, with braided hair, and clad in a shining robe, and her eyes were dim with tears that she might never shed, for she was a goddess, Calypso, the daughter of Atlas. Then in the vision the man looked up, and his face was weary and worn and sick for home, but it was his own face. Then he remembered how he sat thus at the side of Calypso with the braided tresses, on that last night of all his nights in her wave-girt isle, the center of the seas. Look once more, said the voice of Meriam and the queen. Again he looked into the darkness. There before him grew the ruins of his own hall in Ithaca, and in the courtyard before the hall was a heap of ashes and the charred bones of men. Before the heap lay the figure of one lost in sorrow, for his limbs writhed upon the ground. Anon the man lifted his face, and behold, the wanderer knew that it was his own face. Then of a sudden the gloom passed away from the chamber, and once more his blood surged through his veins, and there before him sat Meriam and the queen, smiling darkly. Strange sights hast thou seen. Is it not so, wanderer? She said. Yea, queen, the most strange of sights. Tell me of thy courtesy, how thou didst conjure them before my eyes. By the magic that I have, Apparatus, I above all wizards who dwell in Kim, the magic whereby I can read all the past of those I love. And again she looked upon him, I, and call it forth from the storehouse of dead time, and make it live again. Say, whose face 
was it that thou didst look upon? Was it not the face of Odysseus of Ithaca, the Laertes' son? And was not that face thine? Now the wanderer saw that there was no escape. Therefore he spoke the truth, not because he loved it, but because he must. The face of Odysseus of Ithaca, it was that I saw before me, lady, and that face is mine. I avow myself to be Odysseus, Laertes' son, and no other man. The queen laughed aloud. Great must be my strength of magic, she said, for it can strip the guile from the subtlest of men. Henceforth, Odysseus, thou wilt know that the eyes of Meriam and the queen see far. Now tell me truly, what camest thou hither to seek? The wanderer took swift counsel with himself, remembering that dream of Meriam and of which Ray, the priest, had told him, and which she knew not that he had learned. The dream that showed her the vision of one whom she must love, and remembering the word of the dead Hataska, he grew afraid. For he saw well by the token of the spear point that he was the man of her dream, and that she knew it. But he could not accept her love, both because of his oath to Pharaoh, and because of her, whom Aphrodite had shown to him in Ithaca, her whom alone he must seek, the heart's desire, the golden Helen. The strait was desperate, between a broken oath and a woman scorned. But he feared his oath and the anger of Zeus, the god of hosts and guests. So he sought safety beneath the wings of truth. Lady, he said, I will tell thee all. I came to Ithaca from the white north, where a curse had driven me. I came and found my halls desolate, and my people dead, and the very ashes of my wife. But in a dream of the night, I saw the goddess whom I have worshipped little, Aphrodite of Idalia, whom in this land ye name Hathor, and she bade me go forth and do her will. And for reward, she promised me that I should find one who waited me to be my deathless love. Mariamun heard him so far, but no further, for of this she made sure that she was the woman whom Aphrodite had promised to the wanderer. Ere he might speak another word, she glided to him like a snake, and like a snake curled herself about him. Then she spoke so low that he rather knew her thought than heard her words. Was it indeed so, Odysseus? Did the goddess indeed send thee to seek me out? Know then that not to thee alone did she speak. I also looked for thee. I also awaited the coming of one whom I should love. Oh, heavy have been the days, and empty was my heart, and sorely through the years have I longed for him who should be brought to me. And now at length it is done. Now at length I see him whom in my dream I saw. And she lifted her lips to the lips of the wanderer, and her heart, and her eyes, and her lips said, Love. But it was not for nothing that he bore a stout and patient heart, and a brain unclouded by danger or by love. He had never been in a strait like this, caught with bonds that no sword could cut, and in toils that no skill could undo. On one side were love and pleasure, on the other a broken oath, and the loss forever of the heart's desire. For to love another woman, as he had been warned, was to lose Helen. But again, if he scorned the queen, nay, for all his hardihood he dared not tell her that she was not the woman of his vision, the woman he came to seek. Yet even now his cold courage and his cunning did not fail him. Lady, he said, we both have dreamed, but if thou didst dream thou wert my love, thou didst wake to find thyself the wife of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is my host and hath my oath. I woke to find myself the wife of Pharaoh, she echoed, wearily, and her arms uncurled from his neck, and she sank back on the couch. I am Pharaoh's wife in word, but not in deed. Pharaoh is nothing to me, thou wanderer, naught save a name. Yet is my oath much to me, Queen Mariam, my oath, and the hospitable hearth? The wanderer made answer, I swore to Meneptah to hold thee from all ill, and there's an end. And if Pharaoh comes back no more, what then, Odysseus? Then will we talk again. And now, lady, thy safety calls me to visit thy guard. 
and without more words he rose and went. The queen looked after him. A strange man, she said in her heart, who builds a barrier with his oath betwixt himself and her he loves, and has wandered so far to win. Yet methinks I honor him the more. Pharaoh Meneptah, my husband, eat, drink, and be merry, for this I promise thee, short shall be thy days. End of Book 2, Chapter 2 Recording by Marcel D. Ward, thesoulexpands.com Book 2, Chapter 5 of The World's Desire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, TheSoulExpands.com The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 5 The Chapel Perilous Swift as a bird or a thought says the old harper of the northern sea. The wanderer's thoughts in the morning were swift as night birds, flying back and brooding over the things he had seen and the words he had heard in the queen's chamber. Again, he stood between this woman and the oath which, of all oaths, was the worst to break. And indeed, he was little tempted to break it, for though Mariamun was beautiful, and wise he feared her love and he feared her magic art no less than he feared her vengeance if she were scorned delay seemed the only course let him wait till the king returned and it will go hard but he found some cause for leaving the city of tanis and seeking through new adventures the world's desire the mysterious river lay yonder he would ascend the river of which so many tales were told. It flowed from the land of the blameless Ethiopians, the most just of men, at whose tables the very gods sat as guests. There, perchance, far up the sacred stream, in a land where no wrong ever came, there, if the fates permitted, he might find the golden Helen. If the fates permitted, but all the adventure was of the fates who had shown him to Mariamun in a dream. He took it long in his mind and found little light. It seemed that, as he had drifted through darkness across a blood-red sea to the shores of Kemp, so he should wade through blood to that shore of fate which the gods appointed. Yet after a while, he shook sorrow from him, arose, bathed, anointed himself, combed his dark locks, and girded on his golden armor. For now he remembered that this was the day when the strange Hathor should stand upon the pylon of the temple and call the people to her, and he was minded to look upon her, and if need be, to do battle with that which guarded her. So he prayed to Aphrodite that she would help him, and he poured out wine to her and waited. He waited, but no answer came to this prayer. And yet as he turned away, it chanced that he saw his countenance in the wide golden cup whence he had poured, and it seemed to him that it had grown more fair and lost the snap of years, and that his face was smooth and young as the face of that Odysseus who, many years ago, had sailed in the black ships and looked back on the smoking ruins of windy Troy. In this he saw the hand of the goddess, and he knew that if she might not manifest in this land of strange gods, yet she was with him. And knowing this, his heart grew light as the heart of a boy from whom sorrow is yet a long way off, and who has not dreamed of death. Then he ate and drank, and when he had put from him the desire of food, he rose and girded on the sword. Euryalus's gift, but the black bow he left in its case. Now he was ready and about to set forth when Ray the priest entered the chamber. Whither goest thou, Eperitus? asked Ray. 
the instructed priest, and what is it that has made thy face so fair, and though many years have been lifted from thy back? Tis but sweet sleep, Ray, said the wanderer. Deeply I slept last night, and the weariness of my wanderings fell from me, and now I am as I was before I sailed across the blood-red sea into the night. Sell thou the secret of this sleep to the ladies of Kim, answered the aged priest, smiling, and little shalt thou lack of wealth for all thy days. Thus he spake, as though he believed the wanderer, but in his heart he knew that the thing was of the gods. The wanderer answered, I go up to the temple of the Hathor, for thou dost remember it is today that she stands upon the pylon brow and calls the people to her. Comest thou also, Ray? Nay, nay, I come not, the paratus. I am old indeed, but yet the blood creeps through these withered veins, and perchance, if I came and looked, the madness would seize me also, and I too should rush to my slain. There is a way in which a man may listen to the voice of the Hathor, and that is to have his eyes blindfolded, as many do. But even then, he will tear the bandage from his eyes and look and die with the others. Oh, go not up, Eperitus. I, I pray thee, go not up. I love thee. I know not why, and am little minded to see thee dead, though perchance, he added, as though to himself, it would be well for those I serve if thou wert dead, thou wanderer, with the eyes of fate. Have no fear, Ray, said the wanderer. As it is doomed, so shall I die, and not otherwise. Never shall it be told, he murmured in his heart, that he who stood in arms against Scylla, the horror of the rock, turned back from any form of fear or from any shape of love. Then Ray wrung his hands and went nigh to weeping, for to him it seemed a pitiful thing that so goodly a man and so great a hero should thus be done to death. But the wanderer passed out through the city, and Ray went with him for a certain distance. At length they came to the road set on either side with sphinxes, that leads from the outer wall of brick to the garden of the Temple of Hathor, and down this road hurried a multitude of men of all races and of every age. Here the prince was borne along in his litter. Here the young noble traveled in his chariot. Here came the slave, bespattered with the mud of the fields. Here the cripple limped upon his crutches, and here was the blind man led by a hound. And with each man came women, the wife of the man, or his mother, or his sisters, or she to whom he was vowed in marriage. Weeping they came, and with soft words and clinging arms they strove to hold back him whom they loved. Oh, my son, my son, cried a woman, hearken to thy mother's voice, go not up to look upon the goddess, for if thou dost look, then shalt thou die. And thou alone art left alive to me, two brothers of thine I bore, and behold, both are dead. And wilt thou die also, and leave me, who am old, alone, and desolate? Be not mad, my son, thou art the dearest of all. Ever have I loved thee and tended thee. Come back, I pray, come back. But her son heard not, and heeded not, pressing on toward the gates of the heart's desire. Oh, my husband, my husband, cried another, young, of gentle birth and fair, who bare a babe on her left arm, and with the right clutched her lord's broidered robe. Oh, my husband, have I not loved thee and been kind to thee? And wilt thou still go up to look upon the deadly glory of the Hathor? They say she wears the beauty of the dead. Lovest thou me, not better than her who died five years agone, Marissa, the daughter of Royce, though thou didst love her first? See, here is thy babe, thy babe, but one week born, even from my bed of pain have I risen and followed after thee down these weary roads, and I am like to lose my life for it. Here is thy babe, let it plead with thee, let me die, if so it must be, but go not thou up to thy death. 
It is no goddess whom thou would see, but an evil spirit loosed from the underworld, and that shall be thy doom. Oh, if I please thee not, take thou another wife, and I will make her welcome. Only go not up to thy death. But the man fixed his eyes upon the pylon tops, heeding her not, and at length she sank upon the road, and there with the babe would have been crushed by the chariots, had not the wanderer borne her to one side of the way. Now of all sights, this was the most dreadful. For on every side rose the prayers and lamentations of women, and still the multitude of men pressed on, unheeding. Now thou seest the power of love. And how if a woman be but beautiful enough, she may drag all men to ruin, said Ray the priest. Yes, said the wanderer, a strange sight, truly. Much blood hath this Hathor of thine upon her hands. And yet thou wilt give her thine, wanderer. That I am not minded to do, he answered, yet I will look upon her face and so speak no more of it. Now they were come to the space before the bronze gates of the pylon of the outer court, and there the multitude gathered to the number of many hundreds. Presently, as they watched, a priest came to the gates. That same priest, who had shown the wanderer the bodies in the baths of bronze, he looked through the bars and cried aloud, Whoso would enter into the court and look upon the holy Hathor, let him draw nigh. Know ye this, all men, the Hathor is to him who can win her. But if he pass not, then shall he die and be buried within the temple, nor shall he ever look upon the sun again. Of this ye are warned. Since the Hathor came again to Kim, of men seven hundred and three have gone to win her and of body seven hundred and two lie within the vaults. For of all these men, Pharaoh Minotaur alone hath gone back living. Yet there is place for more. Enter, ye who would look upon the Hathor. Now there arose a mighty wailing from the women. They clung madly about the necks of those who were dear to them, and some clung not in vain. For the hearts of many failed them at the last, and they shrank from entering in. But a few of those who had already looked upon the Hathor from afar, perchance a score and all, struck the women from them, and rushed up to the gates. Surely thou wilt not enter in, quoth Ray, clinging to the arm of the wanderer. Oh, turn thy back on death, and come back with me. I pray thee turn. Nay, said the wanderer, I will go in. Then Ray the priest threw dust upon his head, wept aloud, and turned and fled, never stopping till he came to the palace, where sat Miriam and the queen. Now the priest unbarred a wicket in the gates of bronze, and one by one those who were stricken of the madness entered in, for all of these had seen the Hathor many times from afar without the wall, and now they could no more withstand their longing. And as they entered, Two other priests took them by the hand and bound their eyes with cloths, so that, lest they willed it, they might not see the glory of the Hathor, but only hear the sweetness of her voice. But two there were who would not be blindfolded. And of these one was that man whose wife had fainted by the way, and the other was a man sightless from his youth. For although he might not see the beauty of the goddess, this man was made mad by the sweetness of her voice. Now when all had entered in, save the wanderer, there was a stir in the crowd, and a man rushed up. He was travel-stained, he had a black beard, black eyes, and a nose hooked like a vulture's beak. Hold! he cried, hold! Shut not the gates! Night and day have I journeyed from the hosts of the Apura who fly into the wilderness, Night and day have I journeyed, leaving wife and flocks and children and the promise of the land, that I may once more look upon the beauty of the Hathor. Shut not the gates. Pass in, said the priest, pass in. So shall we be rid of one of those who Kim nurtured up to rob her. He entered. Then, as the priest was about to bar the wicket, the wanderer strolled forward 
and his golden armor clashed beneath the portal. Wouldst thou enter into thy doom, thou mighty lord? asked the priest, for he knew him well again. Ay, I enter, but perchance not to my doom, answered the wanderer. Then he passed in, and the brazen gate was shut behind him. Now the two priests came forward to bind his eyes, but this he would not endure. Not so, he said. I am come here to see what may be seen. Go to, thou madman, go to, and die the death, they answered, and led all the men to the center of the courtyard whence they might see the pile on top. Then the priests also covered up their eyes and cast themselves at length upon the ground. So for a while they lay, and all was silence within and without the court, for they waited the coming of the Hathor. The wanderer glanced through the bars of bronze at the multitude gathered there. Silent they stood with upturned eyes. Even the women had ceased from weeping and stood in silence. He looked at those beside him. Their bandaged faces were lifted, and they stared towards the pylon top as though their vision pierced the cloths. The blind man, too, stared upward, and his pale lips moved, but no sound came from them. Now at the foot of the pylon lay a little rim of shadow, thinner and thinner it grew, as the moments crept on towards the perfect noon. Now there was but a line, and now the line was gone, for the sun's red disk burned high in the blue heaven, straight above the pylon brow. Then suddenly, and from afar, there came a faint, sweet sound of singing. And at the first note of the sound, a great sigh went up through the quiet air, from all the multitude without. Those who were near the wanderer sighed also, and their lips and fingers twitched, and he himself sighed, though he knew not why. Nearer came the sweet sound of singing, and stronger it swelled, till presently those without the temple gate who were on higher ground, caught sight of her who sang. Then a hoarse roar went up from every throat, and madness took them. On they rushed, dashing themselves against the gates of bronze and the steep walls on either side, and beat upon them madly with their fists and brows, and climbed on each other's shoulders, gnawing at the bars with their teeth, crying to be let in. But the women threw their arms about them, and screamed curses on her whose beauty brought all men to madness. So it went for a while, till presently the wanderer looked up, and lo, upon the pylon's brow stood the woman's self, and at her coming all were once more silent. She was tall and straight, clad in clinging white, but on her breast there glowed a bloody red ruby stone, fashioned like a star and from it fell red drops that stained for one moment the whiteness of her robes, and then the robe was white again. Her golden hair was tossed this way and that, and shone in the sunlight. Her arms and neck were bare, and she held one hand before her eyes, as though to hide the brightness of her beauty, for indeed she could not be called beautiful, but beauty itself. And they who had not loved saw in her that first love whom no man has ever known. And they who had loved saw that first love whom every man has lost. And all about her rolled a glory, like the glory of the dying day. Sweetly she sang a song of promise, and her voice was the voice of each man's desire. And the heart of the wanderer thrilled in answer to it, as thrills a harp smitten by a cunning hand and thus she sang whom hast thou longed for most true love of mine whom hast thou loved and lost lo she is thine she that another wed breaks from her vow she that hath long been dead wakes for thee now dreams haunt the hapless bed ghosts haunt the night life crowns her living head love and delight nay not a dream nor a ghost nay but divine she that was loved and lost waits to be thine she ceased and a moan of desire went up from all who heard 
Then the wanderer saw that those beside him tore at the bandages about their brows and rent them loose. Only the priest who lay upon the ground stirred not, though they also moaned. And now again she sang, still holding her hand before her face. Ye that seek me, ye that sue me, ye that flock beneath my tower, ye would win me, would undo me, I must perish in an hour. Dead before the love that slew me, clasped the bride and crushed the flower. Hear the word and mark the warning, beauty lives but in your sight. Beauty fades from all men scorning in the watches of the night. Beauty wanes before the morning, and love dies in his delight. She ceased, and once more there was a silence. Then suddenly she bent forward across the pylon brow so far that it seemed that she must fall, and stretching out her arms as though to clasp those beneath, showed all the glory of her loveliness. The wanderer looked, then dropped his eyes as one who has seen the brightness of the noonday sun. In the darkness of his mind the world was lost, and he could think of naught save the clamor of the people which fretted his ears. They were all crying, and none were listening. See, see, shouted one. Look at her hair. It is dark as the raven's wing, and her eyes, they are dark as night. Oh, my love, my love. See, see, cried another. Were ever sky so blue as those eyes of hers? Was ever foam so white as those white arms? Even so she looked whom once I wed many summers gone, murmured a third. Even so when first I drew her veil. Hers was that gentle smile breaking like ripples on the water. Hers that curling hair. Hers that childlike grace. Was ever woman so queenly made, said a fourth. Look now on the brow of pride. Look on the deep dark eyes of storm, the arched lips, and the imperial air. Ah, here indeed is a goddess meet for worship. Not so, I see her, cried a fifth, that man who had come from the host of the Apura. Pale she is and fair, tall indeed, but delicately shaped. Brown is her hair, and brown are her great eyes, like the eyes of a stag. And ah, sadly, she looks upon me, looking for my love. My eyes are opened, screamed the blind man at the wanderer's side. My eyes are open, and I see the pylon tower and the splendid sun. Love hath touched me on the eyes, and they are opened. But lo, not one shape hath she, but many shapes. Oh, she is beauty's self, and no tongue may tell her glory. Let me die, let me die, for my eyes are opened. I have looked on beauty's self. I know what all the world journeys on to seek, and why we die, and what we go to find in death. End of Book Two, Chapter Five. Recording by Marcel D. Ward, The Soul Expands dot com.